Thank you very much, David. Uh, actually, if I could ask David to, to remain um, here as well, so I'll ask uh, Debbie and Ulrika perhaps to come back and we could take a, a few questions um, on, on, that, uh, on those presentations. So, have we any uh, burning issues that we'd, we'd like to uh, talk about? Yeah, here's, here's one Thank you. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Kenlin, uh, working for Extensa. I think the only private company here, so we are developers uh, and also interested in uh, robot car systems. And I don't have a question, I, I, I liked what Mr. Myers, Myers. Myers just told and I think uh, I from the private sector want to stress that, that the biggest enemy from robot car systems is the uh, subjective attachment of the people to their car and I would like to appeal to all producers to really uh, do what automobile, automobile uh, companies do try to find designers that make the experience that make the pot car look as sexy as the most uh, sexy cars I think this will be important for the success of the systems also for the private sector Thank you. Uh, David, have you got any comments uh, on that? I think you made some good points in your presentation. But. Well, I would, I would totally agree with that. The, the connection people have with how they spend their money in cars is, is very subjective. And to overcome that, you're going to need much more than just a data-driven decision to get people into, into uh, pod cars. So understanding that, taking advantage of that, and creating an even better solution around pod cars is, is very critical. Can I make a comment on that? Um, because in America, we really are seeing, you know, unemployment is 10%. We now have many, many thousands of people who are parking their cars because they can't either afford to maintain them or to buy gas. And we need to start thinking about this a little, maybe a little differently, or add something onto this discussion, which is that a solution isn't a solution if it isn't affordable. And so while the car will be a great you know, thing for those who can afford it, at least in America, there is a growing sector that will not be able to afford the automobile. And, uh, and so we need to think of these alternatives. Thank you. Just one point for me as well on that particular subject was that, um, and I, I speak from a Heathrow and uh, Ultra perspective, is that we spent an awful lot of time and money uh, looking at the passenger experience um, rather, rather than the engineering. Engineering is important as well, all the technology that goes on underneath has got to work, but it has to work for the passenger. And, you know, they're the ultimate critic. If they don't like it, for whatever reason, it isn't going to be a success. So we invested a lot of money in design. And, and Carl Humphries is in the audience. Uh, he will be talking on that subject um, later today, I think. So please go along and, and Carl will explain all that. Um, I've got the microphone here, if I can. A uh, question for Ulrika. Yep. Um, I was fascinated with your your ability to pull together all of these different stakeholders uh, and, and driving towards consensus on what was required. Is your report available in English on the web? No, I'm sad. Sad, no. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to get in touch with some of the, 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 the work that's still going on and the creation of what they're doing, I will give you, I can give you some names you okay, can get you. in touch with. Uh, could I make a comment on this last issue? I think it's, um, it's vital because, I mean, here in Europe we have a gas price that is four times as high as in the US. And if you go to a city like Stockholm, the parking prices, if you have a car within the city, they are tremendous. And it's more and more hard to have a car. My kids, they are 30 and 27 years old, they don't have driving license. I don't know if you would find that in the US because they, are they trust the public transport system that will take them anywhere, absolutely anywhere. If you go in within this community of Stockholm, you can go practically anywhere by public transport, and it's subsidized by 50% tax subsidies. So we are experiencing a change, and it doesn't have anything to do with design, it does has to do with money. It's not worth the money. You can go out and have more fun on that money. 
He prob my son probably knows three or four recipes on dry martinis instead of having a car. I don't know if that's sensible or not, but that is, that is his choice. Because he wants to have other experiences, because it's not worth chasing around <coughs> car parks in the afternoon and so on. So we, I think we are, in a way, experiencing a change. And this has been possible to a fantastic public transport system that everybody is relying on and where you can go everywhere fairly cheap. It's affordable for everybody. Uh, so I think, you know, there are ways that are changing. It's not only design, it's money and time issues as well in this. Well, we're seeing young people have different attitudes toward cars these days. Even in America, there are some cities where they are giving up the car and uh, they're the, able to get around. The number of um, uh, high school graduates getting driver's license as the ratio is going down. And the third um, a key critical decision factor on which higher education school to go to is which um, what type of public transit system is available in the city that the college is located in. It's now becoming a big decision factor which school, uh, which college they go to. In fact, at the airport at LAX, I overheard two of the security people, uh, whatever they're called, um, they were discussing the cost of parking at their colleges, and they were deciding that whether they could afford to buy them or not. So there is a change. Yes. Do you have any further questions? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to ask, I, I'm Ben Christensen from Beamways, and uh, I wanted to ask Ulrika a little bit about this group of stakeholders. Um, are there any podcast specific stakeholders in the group? Are there any <laughs> podcast related projects that you're planning to complete? No, there isn't, but there could have been. Uh, we have uh, sort of split it on, on certain transportation systems. That's what we wanted to have society. We wanted to have the companies that provide transportation, logistic companies that provide, that provide transportation systems. We wanted to the consumers and society. So we haven't really split it in that way. So there's always room for podcast systems to get in there <coughs> if there is an interest on it. But I might add, it's, it's not a... You have to, if you want to be part of this, you have to pay a bit your own way. It's not a free uh, hub or forum to get into. Thank you. Martin? Am I coming across okay? Yes. Uh, I'd like to get back to the question about, um, from Extensa, um, about what, what value you should build into podcasts. Uh, and I reacted strongly against the word sexy because I see that as being a, a characteristic of conventional cars. When we started the ultra design, our objective was to make one uh, system which was friendly and welcoming to the passengers. And I think we, we did that very much with the help of BAA. And the evidence is that that is what turns people on to use the system, something which, which meets those sort of objectives, rather than meeting the old-fashioned car objectives to make it more and more exciting. But those are the normal sexy ones for the woman. Oh, no, I don't know. <laughs> 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 it, it wasn't designed. It wasn't designed to be like that. It was designed to be friendly and working with and cute and all, 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 all these things. Yes, but if you can throw in the triple threat. You know, if you've got the triple threat, if you can sing and dance and act, then you get the job. So I, I'm going to go, you know, you've got to have the sex appeal as well. Next question, please. Uh, Larry Fabian, uh, uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Can you hear me? No, just hold it a bit closer. Okay. Uh, Larry Fabian, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, getting back to the theme of the conference, and we were we finally started really to move into it is the lifestyle change. Uh, my 25 year old son doesn't own a car. There are very definitely pockets of non car owning people emerging <coughs> in Washington D.C. Uh, and related to that is the emergence and rapid growth of zip cars. That's the American term for car sharing schemes, where they kind of mini, mini car rentals. And now there's an even newer one where it's more like a social network, and you kind of rent out the empty place in the back of your car if you're driving or find rides that way. 
I think these are wonderful allies for this industry to kind of gain some traction. And I'm wondering if anyone else here is seeing that or actually reaching out to those communities. Uh, could anybody comment on that? In, in, uh, yeah, I mean, is it part of perhaps a week of what uh, was being thought of in terms of your community? Well, we, def we have those systems and they are ex constantly expanding. Maybe not as fast as everybody thought a couple of years ago. But uh, cars being expensive, parking being scarce, it's a very popular system. I've got one system like that uh, next to where I live. Uh, th there was a bit of a there is a bit of a problem that everybody wants to use the cars at the same time. In Sweden we have a tradition of having houses, cottages out in the countryside. So everybody leaves on Friday afternoon and comes back on, on uh, Sunday. And so everybody is booking the cars for Friday afternoon so it's, and Christmas holidays and so on. So there has been you know, congestion at certain times which has not probably made it expand. But they are expanding a bit. I think that there's a uh, mindset shift with, I think you're referring to ride sharing, like car sharing, um, that you you pay for what you use, where in, in, in the US you, you own three vehicles and you pay for them 24 hours a day and you use them on average 1.9 hours a day, but you pay for them the entire time and it's obviously not very economically efficient. And so all these systems, including pod cars, you're paying for just what you use. And I think that becomes much more economically viable for a much wider range of people than to own the device that you use only a partial part of every day. Um, but, you know, it doesn't, well, it, it, obviously we need to do more car sharing and, and bicycle sharing and all of that. But, you know, the first and the last mile is the big issue for all of transit. And I know we struggled with it in Southern California because when price of oil spikes and everybody starts using the, the limited transit we have, there's no parking available at the at the stations. We fill up with parking, so really our limiting our limiting resource is the parking issue. So how do we, you know, how do we deal with that first and last mile? And um, and we also need to include the bicycle as well as the the car sharing thing. Thanks. Uh, we've still got time for a couple more questions. So, are there any uh, further takers? Jan Erik Nowatski from the GTS Foundation. Uh, I have a question of a philosophical character, more to any one of you. Are we really aiming at the right? right um, scientific level when we are discussing transport. We are living in a world now where we can split an atom, we can analyze DNA, we can go to the moon, we have terrible IT systems going on with quantum computers etc. And at the same time, in Sweden at least, we are meditating on how to hack the ice with iron bars uh, from the switches in the railway, or how to defrost the wagons that come in. Are we really dealing with the right level? Should we rise transportation to the same level as we raised IT? Creating an internet for people and goods, for instance, wouldn't that be a nice way to ask a, a question if we could do that? Right. Would anyone care to comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting point. Um, no? uh, I'm not sure I have an answer personally, but I think certainly there's a room to, to connect to what we have much better. I, I, in the UK, I see so many trucks going along that are empty. They're delivered to uh, a location and they're going back empty, and yet there's another truck going in the other direction uh, that's full. That, Surely, there's a better way of sort of um, sharing those loads amongst themselves and, and, and uh, reducing the number of journeys that, that are empty. So, you know, things like that could be done by better connections amongst the existing systems. And I imagine that's the sort of thing that we could, uh, you're trying to achieve. What we are trying to achieve, I, I, not the level that you you are explaining, I think, but we're trying to get the R and D that is done in this sector to get together and lift it. Because there are so many, in Sweden at least, so many small projects that are not where you've got funding uh, because the university system works like that. You have to run every day to get your funding, otherwise you don't exist. And you can get your funding wherever you can. And it's not a very rational way for being developing R&D in, in the right way. 
So what we tried to do here was to get this together, and the hope, of course, is that we should raise the level uh, on this. But uh, 20 years is not a very long time, actually. If you go back 20 years from now and see what we did in the 99, what, 92, it's basically the same thing. So, I mean, 20 years is not that a long time. It's a long time between a horse and a car. It's 100 years, but 20 years is not a very long time. And uh, yes, there are issues that we can do, but it's still hard to, to, um, to transportation systems. And I'm a fan of Star Trek, and I would always say, Scotty, now is a good time to beat me up. And if we've got anything like that, of course, coming through, it would be a great, 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 great trip for transportation. Well, I'd like to actually, I mean, you're onto something there. In Los Angeles, when they built the, the, the light rail system, they actually installed what they needed, the technology they needed to actually be able to tell someone waiting on the platform when the next train is arriving, but they didn't do it. Um, and I don't know if it was funding or whatever, but they, they have that capability, they just haven't gotten there. But you could increase ridership on buses dramatically if people knew when the bus, next bus was going to come. Because we have some lines that only run once every hour, and if you think, oh, did I did he come a minute early and I missed it, you know, you uh, there's so much that could be done to in, improve on the efficiency of, of. And now that we have smartphones, it, everybody can know basically all of that information. It's, but I don't know if the funding is there. I, I think when you make the, um, the, the the human subjective appeal within the product, it, it takes off, and I think like with the internet. When, when phones and, 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 and social networking and all of that type of human side connection with the internet or with iPhones and iPads and so forth, that business went crazy. And I think if we can get that same humanistic interest and excitement around pod cars, like it's in with cars today, you'll also accelerate the adoption and excitement around pod cars to pull it forward. It'll eventually come, but if you can add that to it, it'll come that much faster. Uh, we do have in most cities in Sweden that system that tells you where the bus comes. And then you have to remember also that the IT solutions have made it possible for the public transport to expand within this existing system. We, could, we are now pushing in more and more underground trains into the existing system because we can take down the safety requirements. So we're using that to transport more and more people. So it's we are using the, the, the modern technology to expand. And you can have an app for trains, for instance, in your iPhone if you want to. So there are things coming up, but, but it's not been used in a way that the customer can see it, uh, really. But within the system, it's used constantly. OK, I think um, it's uh, now lunchtime. So um, I, I think uh, we've got uh, this morning's proceedings to a close. I'd like to thank the three speakers again very much for their interesting and fascinating contributions uh, on a much wider area than just, just podcasts and just make you think about how this does need to be joined up better. So uh, once again, thank you very much.